This gold cartridge is amazing! Hey folks, Nick Culbertson here. One of my most vivid memories as a child with video games is when I first got my hands on The Legend of Zelda for NES. I still remember my mom took me to the electronics store at the mall and there it was, that golden box sitting on the rack behind the counter. My mom purchased the game and then we walked away with that plastic bag clenched in my sweaty kid hand, full of anticipation. On the way out, we made a quick stop to the department store so my mom could try on some clothes from the sales rack. I'm sure I was badgering her to get us home right now. But at this point, she had completely perfected the skill of ignoring me entirely. <laughs> well played, mom. After waiting for what seemed like an eternity, I finally opened up the box to reveal the golden cartridge. It was like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, only this was real. Mom, let's go. When we finally got home, you want to know what happened? I don't remember. That was the end of the memory. That poor little boy is still waiting to play Zelda. In the days and weeks that followed, my brother and I got consumed with our second life in The Legend of Zelda. This was a game you could get entirely lost in. And then whenever you came back later, it would actually save your progress so you could pick up where you left off. We didn't know at the time, but this was because there's a little internal battery that comes in the Zelda cartridge somewhere. In other games from the era, if you wanted to save your progress, that would have meant just turning off the TV and leaving your NES on overnight. Seemed kind of risky, but it never failed. The game was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takeshi Tezuka. The development team that created Zelda was working on Super Mario Bros. at the same time. While Mario was the definitive platformer, Zelda became the archetype for the top-down action-adventure game. Games like Adventure for Atari had used the top-down screen-to-screen navigation view, but the graphics upgrade for the NES made it feel more like a world you could escape into. The art of Zelda leaves a lot open for interpretation. We can look to the Nintendo manual to see how some of these enemies were intended to be interpreted, but the beauty of having these characters depicted in so few pixels leaves it up to the player's imagination to fully render these characters in the player's mind. One such example of this is the enemy Pole's voice. Now when I see this character, I see a cute little bunny hopping around, but when compared with the Pole's voice artwork from the Legend of Zelda board game, you'll see this nose-haired nightmare fuel. What the actual? Famicom Disk System of Japan is where the game was first released. And just look at this. It has those big chunky embossed Nintendo letters, and it comes in a little paper sleeve like a little video game burrito. Miyamoto said with The Legend of Zelda he wanted to, and I quote, give players a miniature garden that they could put inside their drawer. And he didn't mean like draws, like the draws you wear, although that could work too. So. His inspiration for the game came from wandering around nature in Kyoto as a child. In Zelda, he wanted the player to feel that sense of discovery and what it feels like to kill a monster with a wooden sword. When I was a child, I went hiking and found a lake. It was quite a surprise for me to stumble upon it. When I traveled around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. I live in Dallas, so there's not a lot of nature for me to stumble upon, but we do have this bulk trash pickup where people just things they want to get rid of, they put on the curb. I walked by one day, I found a skateboard. At least I think they were throwing it away. Look at that. Perfectly good trash skateboard. Someone also threw away this robot. You're a garbage hoarder. Let's take off the nostalgia glasses for a little bit and see what it is about The Legend of Zelda that makes it the seminal archetype for action-adventure games. I think Zelda is best remembered for its game design, which is hard to tease apart from the graphics because that's how we experience the game. But do those graphics hold up today? Well, do they? Punk? That's what we're gonna find out right now. Let's get started. Here is The Legend of Zelda for the NES. We create a name and a save file for our game before being dropped defenselessly into the land of Hyrule. Our first stop is entering this cave where we encounter an old man in one of video games' most iconic moments. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. After getting the sword, Link returns to the overworld to wander about aimlessly until he finds the entrance to a dungeon. The world of Zelda is basically split into three types of environments. The overworld, which is the largest section. The underworld, or dungeons, that contain a color swap tile set and dungeon-specific enemies. And caves, shops, and secret rooms like the ones where Link first acquires the sword. 
There are five total frames of animation for Link's movement. Two frames for each directional movement with the left and right frames being flipped and the upward walk animation being one sprite flipped on its Y axis. There are three frames for attacking, two for picking up an item, and four additional frames for when Link is holding the large shield. So in total, Link's entire existence in The Legend of Zelda is only 14 frames. That number can be reduced even further when we eliminate the parts of the character that are mirrored or repeated into a 16 by 144 image. One of the requirements for early NES games were keeping things as lean as possible. Data was at a premium, and it had to be shared between the music, art, and program. Because of this, you'll see how they stretch the limited sprite space to the absolute max. I love this frame where Link is jabbing his sword and yelling. There aren't many pixels to use in Link's 16 by 16 full body sprite to show much facial detail, but this frame makes him feel like a dynamic, expressive character. Oh wait, don't look! What color are Link's eyebrows? I mean, you were just looking at him. If you said brown or black, you are probably a rational person. But no, they are in fact green. Why are they green? It is to highlight the contour of the... I'm just kidding, I have no idea why they're green. The perspective of the world and characters is a bit of a mystery. The angles of the characters are usually from one of three perspectives. From the top down, like the Octoroks, a 45 degree angle like the Tektites, or a 90 degree side-scrolling angle like the Ropes. Even the angles on Link seem inconsistent based on the direction he is facing. When going up and down the screen, you'll see his feet disappear under his body from this 45 degree perspective. But when traveling left or right, the perspective shifts to being a side-scrolling 90 degree angle. In Link to the Past, this perspective is somewhat corrected by showing more of the top of Link's head and having overlapping sections from his head to his feet, retaining that 45 degree angle. As Link explores the overworld looking for a dungeon, he encounters an eclectic mix of enemies. The overworld enemies are different from the dungeon enemies and are all accessible from the start of the game. Now let's take a detailed look at the enemies of the overworld. First, there are the Tektites, one-eyed spider creatures that come in orange or blue. The Tektite has a two-frame bouncing animation and the position of its legs reinforces that 45 degree angle. Another one of the earliest mobs are the Octoroks. This projectile firing character also comes in two color variants and it has a two frame animation that can be rotated in four directions based on where it's facing. The perspective for this character is a true top down angle. This image over here on the side is actually the concept art that comes from the instruction manual. In the booklet, they had a highly rendered image of each of the characters, but in this case, I don't see the sprite character as looking the same as the concept art. Rather than being a land octopus, I see this as a little tiny ball with legs, similar to the way the Octoroks were depicted later on in Four Swords. The Octorok design in Ocarina of Time more closely resembles this design, but an early prototype of the game shows the character more closely resembling the blob with legs character design. Shortly after the release of the game, there was the Legend of Zelda strategy guide printed in Japan, and it had some of the best unofficial artwork depicting high-res versions of the characters more closely resembling their in-game sprites. So you can kind of think of it as the instruction booklet has the concept art that informed the design of the sprites, and those sprites were then used to inform the design of the high-res versions from the strategy guide. Next we have Levers. They are spiked sand creatures in red or blue that can burrow underground to move around undetected. This character has a total of five animation frames, more than any other overworld enemy. Three frames are for going in and out of the sand, and two frames are for the spinning movement animation. Even though the movie came out four years later, I remember the levers reminding me of the Graboids from Tremors. The manual depicts the white parts as sharp, wavy blades, but those would become more beak-like in Ocarina of Time. Now do you see the Tremors comparison? Next we have the P-Hats. The depiction of this character in the manual shows it having a large, tall body, which I wouldn't have expected. I guess I always saw this character as existing in a flat 2D space. This is an example of a sprite where you render the character in your mind without having any real world or fantasy world equivalent. Next we have the Moblins, which look like a Bulldog Goblin mix. The image in the manual looks like an awesome Dungeons & Dragons character. What a pitiful looking monster buddy. The character comes in two color variants and uses four sprite frames for all of its movement. The movement animation when moving up or down the screen uses a single sprite flipped on the Y axis, and the left and right movement toggles between two sprites that are flipped depending on the direction that the Moblin is facing. While some of the earlier enemies have been more abstract, the Moblin has a higher level of detail on its sprite. Giving the character a large head allows enough space to render all the character's unique facial features. Next we have Armos, which are stone enemies that only move after being touched sometimes revealing a hidden entrance to a cave. The manual shows Armos as a humanoid guard, but I always saw them as looking more like a uh, one-eyed Teddy Grahams with a pitchfork. The Japanese strategy guide is here to set the record straight. My bad, it's not actually a Teddy Graham after all. 
Next, we have guineas, the one-eyed ghost creatures from the graveyard. Wait, for some reason the booklet has the guineas having two eyes, but in the game in the Japanese strategy guide, it only has one eye. But also the image from the strategy guide shows the guineas having two legs, which is different from the actual in-game sprite. I, so I don't know, I don't know nothing. The sprite image from the manual also shows the guinea with two legs, which makes me think that the manual was actually printed early while the game was still in active development, leaving in some of the unfinished art assets. Guineas only have two sprites, one for facing the bottom of the screen and one for facing the top. As the series continued, guineas would take on more of a Boo from Mario Brothers look. Next we have the Lionels, lion-headed centaurs that come in orange or blue. I love the names for these characters, the Lionels, Tektites. It sounds like the lineup for an indie music festival. In Breath of the Wild, the Lionel has become a total beefcake. Like Link, these creatures can shoot sword projectiles across the screen, and they start out pretty tough until Link gets the Master Sword. They're actually probably the most difficult overworld enemy. They have four frames of movement like the Moblins with the sprites flipped to make the up and down movement animations, and two frames when moving side to side. Next there is Zola, the fireball spitting sea creature that pops up just off the shore. Nintendo notoriously likes to borrow characters from the public domain, and this character most closely resembles the creature from the Black Lagoon. The concept art for this character in the manual is one of the coolest, and Zola is also prominently featured on the US Legend of Zelda board game. There was also a Legend of Zelda board game that was a Japanese exclusive, and that version looked really cool. Too bad we never got it here. Our final overworld enemy is Rock. It's, it's just a rock. It does have a two-frame animation, though. Like many NES games, we see the developers opting to use a palette swap to change the color of characters to create a new enemy. This makes the upgraded enemy instantly recognizable and takes advantage of the extremely limited space of an NES cartridge. The technique for palette swapping on the enemies can also be seen on the tiles of the overworld and the underworld. This is most obvious in the dungeons that change color depending on the level you're on. Although the overworld feels like a large, unending expanse, the variety for the map is provided with only a small handful of tiles. Take for example this area that contains a good variety in tile selection. This entire map scene was composed using just 9 tiles. Clever placement in addition to the palette swapping of the tiles makes the terrain feel dynamic as you traverse through the various regions. Legend of Zelda is one of the first what the hell do I do now games. Since this was before the internet, the only way you could beat this game was to be an expert cryptographer decoding the in-game messages, do all the things to all the blocks, or get a strategy guide, either Nintendo Power or Tips and Tactics. The instruction manual that came with Legend of Zelda had some of the tricks in it, but at a certain point you're gonna have to figure out that you have to go to this secret room to buy this pork chop and then give it to this bad guy in this dungeon to be able to advance. <laughs> Duh. As we make our way into the first dungeon, you'll notice that the world has changed. Each dungeon in the game uses the same tiles with a palette swap. It's a subtle change but effective in differentiating the levels and signifying progression throughout the game. This image shows all of the possible rooms that are created within a dungeon. From a technical standpoint, it's most likely that they created each of the rooms using an array and then loaded these rooms accordingly based on which map piece you were on in each dungeon. But once again, with that limited amount of space on the cartridge, there was a finite number of rooms they could use to construct these dungeons. The walls for each dungeon room are exactly the same, with the exception of what is going in the place of the doors. The enemies for the underworld include an entirely new cast of characters. First we have Zol, the obligatory RPG slime monster. Zol is split into two smaller entities called gels when hit. These characters each have a two-frame bounce animation which always faces forward. Next we have a snake enemy that's called a rope. That sounds like a grandpa joke, calling a rope a snake. Ropes have a two-frame animation which can be flipped either left or right facing. This is the only character that doesn't face down at the bottom of the screen, and the perspective is more of that 90 degree side-scrolling angle. Next we have Keese, the little blue bat, and Vire, the large blue bat creature that explodes into two red bats when hit. Vire has a cute movement animation where he does a complete splits when he's hopping around the screen, but the character is much more menacing when we look at the art from the manual, and there's even this collage of enemies in the Japanese strategy guide that shows Vire in a much darker light. Pun intended. Next we have Stalfos, the skeleton. You can't have a dungeon game without skeletons, that's just the rule. Stalfos ties for having the easiest animation, being just one sprite flipped from left to right. Next is Wallmaster, the hand monster that can grab Link and send him back to the beginning of the dungeon. This was probably the scariest enemy as a kid. This little pinchy hand has a two frame animation and it's still coming after me. Let's move on to the next one. Next we have Garaya, a little boomerang throwing bad guy in orange or blue. I always thought they were like little hog creatures like Ganon. 
Now it seems way less dark that Link feeds one of them a pork chop. Oh, so looking at the image in the manual, this white thing that kind of looks like a mustache actually is a mustache. Wait, I just noticed that the Gariah's mustache is shaped like the boomerang. This can't be a coincidence. The Gariya has a similar moveset to the Moblins with two frames of animation for sideways movement and a rotating sprite while traveling up and down the screen. The Japanese strategy guide depicts the white part as being more of a mouth, but I'm just too invested in this white mustache idea now. Next we have the Wiz Robes who have one of the coolest looking character poses in the game. They also have an orange and blue variant, but the enemy AI for each is quite different, with the orange Wiz Robes teleporting around the screen and the blue ones traveling freely wherever they like. When I was playing this game again with my daughter, I captured this glitch on camera. Wizrobe gonna do what Wizrobe gonna do. I always thought this character resembled Orko from He-Man. They even share the circle on their costumes. Next are the Dark Nuts, which kinda look like kitty cat eared knights. They come in a blue and orange variant, and along with the Wizrobes are some of the hardest enemies from the game. There is an incredible amount of detail in this tiny sprite. They perfectly execute a full suit of armor, helmet, shield, and sword in a 16x16 16 16 sprite. Notice in the manual the Dark Nut shield is more rounded and doesn't have the cross design. Also, the Stalfos is missing a pixel in its neck, and Pole's voice doesn't have its whiskers. What are you hiding, Nintendo? Next, we're on to Pole's voice, a cute or gnarly bunny creature depending on how you want to look at it. In the Japanese release, Pole's voice could be defeated by yelling into the microphone on the controller. An artifact of this functionality can be found in the US manual saying Pole's voice hates loud norms. This confused players into having them use the flute, but in the US version, shooting an arrow at Pole's voice takes them out in just one hit. If Miyamoto's goal was to elicit a sense of discovery in the player, imagine how cool it must have been to have the Famicom version, read the hint, yell into the controller, and see Pole's voice disappear from the screen. Next we have Land Mola, a giant centipede. The concept art for this character looks totally wicked and extremely basic in the game. A similar character is Moldrum, the giant worm, which actually shares some of its sprites with the projectile fireball. Next we have the Like Likes, two monsters that can wrap around Link when he's hit. I always thought these looked like a stack of pancakes, but my daughter thought that it looked like a hamburger. But if we take a look at the like like from the manual, you will see something far less appetizing, like flan covered in hair. Next we have the Gibdo, a mummy having a dance party in the dungeon. I've decided one of my favorite things in any video game is whipping Link's boomerang across the screen. Like the Stalfos, Gibdo's animation is one sprite flipped from right to left. The character's rounded head makes it look more like Grimace from McDonald's. And I just realized all my points of reference in this game are based on food. Next is the Bubble, a static wrapped skull with a soft caramel center that when hitting Link makes him unable to use his sword for a short time. Our last non-boss enemies from the underworld are environment enemies, traps and stone statues. The trap sprite is very simple, but you immediately know what it is after you see it fling across the screen for the first time. The two statues are actually quite charming as they are two of the largest faces rendered in the game. When Link finds a secret item room in the dungeons, the entire screen is composed of just three tiles. This shift into 2D side-scrolling while in the item room would become a major component of the sequel Zelda II The Adventure of Link. Now let's take a look at the biggest baddies from the game, the bosses. In Dungeon 1, Link faces off against Aqua Menace, a side-facing enemy that looks about as scary as a blow-up unicorn dragon at a child's birthday party. Even the manual's rendition has an inflatable quality to it. While this enemy may not be particularly scary, it does set the tone that each dungeon will have a unique enemy guarding the Triforce piece. In the second dungeon, Link faces off against Dodongo, the giant Triceratops. The old man in the dungeon gives us the hint that Dodongo dislikes smoke, so we use our bombs to blow them to smithereens. Similar to the look in Punch-Out, I like how the Dodongo's eyes get really large when it's stunned. In Dungeon 3, Link faces off against Manhandela, a four-headed Venus flytrap looking monster. The perspective for this boss does a great job of adhering to that 45 degree angle. Time your bombs just right and you can take this boss out without breaking a sweat. In Dungeon 4, Link rebattles Manhandela on his way to the final boss room, establishing that these bosses will be returning. In the final room of this dungeon, Link faces off against Gliok, a huge multi-headed dragon. When Gliok's heads are destroyed, they turn red and detach from the body and start roaming around as their own entity. The first incarnation of Gliok has two heads, but that number will increase as we get deeper into the game. In Dungeon 5, things start getting a little more tricky. This is when I start using what I like to call turtle straps, where I hit an enemy and then retreat into the safety of the doorframe. It takes longer this way, but you'll add years to your life, not stressing over staying alive. It also becomes a pretty essential tactic if you've skipped the power-ups like the shield and armor upgrades as I have. More on that later. 
After getting the hint that Dig Dogger doesn't like loud sounds, we play the flute for this jumbo sea urchin, then finish it off with our sword. Next, on the way to Dungeon 6, we grab the meat. We could grab the ring to upgrade Link's armor, but we'll skip that for now since we're a little low on funds. We navigate our way through the secret forest and make our way inside of the 6th dungeon. This would be a good time for a public service announcement. Upgrade your armor or you will die, die, die. Sometimes you'll get lucky and pick up these clocks that freeze the enemies. We fight a three-headed Gleok this time on our way to the final boss room where we battle Goma. Get out the arrow, aim at the eye, and this fight is over before it started. On the way to Dungeon 7, we stop off at the Fairy Fountain to refill our hearts before we play the flute where fairies don't live. This was the absolute coolest secret in the entire game. This dungeon is a sampler platter of half the enemies we've faced so far. We hand off the meat to our new mustache friend, find the candle, and face off in a rematch against Bounce House Aquamentis. I would have expected them to do a color swap of this version of the boss just like they did with Goma. Here's the entrance to Dungeon 8. Oh wait, you don't see it? If Dungeon 7 was a sampler platter of half the enemies, Dungeon 8 is a sampler platter of the other half of the enemies. You know, like one has cheese sticks and hot wings, while the other one has like twice baked potatoes and jalapeno poppers. We master the art of our turtle food to get through this dungeon. Just get the armor upgrade. In the final room, we face off against a four-headed Gleok. He's much more difficult this time, but find your rhythm and you'll send him crying back to Ganon. Now that we've defeated the horde of bad guys, we're ready to head to Dungeon 9 and finish the fight. On the way, this is a good chance to stock up on all the other gear we might have missed, like heart containers and the Master Sword. Then we bomb this rock and make our way into Dungeon 9. This level is a boss rush endurance match that is confusing to navigate. On our way to Ganon, we fight a new boss, Petra. Petra's a big flying eyeball surrounded by other little flying eyeballs. But give him a little pokey poke and we're ready to move on. There are more locked doors than keys, and at some point, there's a good chance you'll have to restock before you can advance. Alright, so we could probably squeak by with just a couple of keys, but if we're gonna power up, we should do it all the way. That's gonna mean a lot of grinding. Are you ready? You know what this means. It's time for another montage. Let's go! It's kind of hard growing up in Hyrule, killing monsters just to earn a coin. Debts are piling up and so are the bodies. I love child I went hiking and found a lake. It was quite a surprise for me to stumble upon it. When I traveled around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. How do you like my new digs? All right, time to beat Ganon. When Link has the new armor, it effectively doubles the amount of damage he can take. Even with that advantage, the whiz ropes can still do a massive amount of damage. As we make our way through the labyrinth of Dungeon 9, we finally arrive at Ganon's chambers. Ganon teleports all over the place, but if you go down in this left-hand corner, you can just spam your sword right into his belly. When Ganon is stunned, fire the blue arrow into him and blow his butt to kingdom come. Retrieve the Triforce and enter the next room to free Princess Zelda. Shoo wee! God dog! Roll the credits! Thanks, Link. You're the hero of Hyrule. Finally, peace returns to Hyrule. This ends the story. At the end of the credits, there's a message saying another quest will start from here. In the second quest, things appear to be much the same until you get to this screen where now there is a shop instead of the entrance to Dungeon 2. If it was Shigeru Miyamoto's goal to make a world that people could feel like they were escaping into, then mission accomplished. To me as a kid, this game sparked my imagination. And that's why I love the artwork of The Legend of Zelda. The original Zelda got a 16-bit reskin of sorts with the release of BS Zelda. The BS stands for Broadcast System, not what you were thinking, Potty Mouth. The sequel to Legend of Zelda was Zelda II The Adventure of Link. 
I applaud Nintendo for trying something new, and while reinvention is a staple of the Zelda series, I think I personally prefer the top-down classic Zelda. Now I know a lot of you like Zelda 2 out there, and to be fair, I kind of suck at it, and a lot of times I don't like games I suck at, except for maybe Castlevania. Fans of the top-down style would have to wait until A Link to the Past on SNES, followed by Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. Regardless of the Legend of Zelda game you think is best, there's no denying that this gold cartridge is amazing! And that's it. Now you have worn my eyeballs and seen what makes the art of The Legend of Zelda such a hottie. Now, years later, as an adult man-child, I have a new appreciation for The Legend of Zelda. As a game developer, I paid homage to this top-down style whenever I created my own game, Bumpin' Dungeon. But I'm not here to promote my own game. As a pixel artist, I recently took part in the Redraw Hyrule Challenge. The tile I reimagined was for L4, here's my version and here's the original. It's a collaboration between various pixel artists who are reimagining the map from the original Zelda game, but doing it in their own style. And as a game-er, I've gotten to relive the experience for the first time all over again, playing this game with my four-year-old daughter. Anytime a secret is revealed, she goes, Thanks for watching the video folks, be sure to like and subscribe and let me know in the comments what some of your earliest Zelda memories were. I'm curious to see if it had such a big impact on you all as it did for me. Now I'm off on my own adventure. See what kind of trash my neighbors are throwing out. One man's trash is another man's skateboarding robot. See y'all next time.